Okay, so now we're going to discuss the pediatric congenital CNS malformations. Let's start by talking about what are the topics we're going to discuss. We're first of all going to look at congenital anomalies of the spinal cord, and then we'll move on to discuss the congenital anomalies of the brain. So let's start by talking about how our brain develops during the fetal period. Well, during the fetal period, there is a structure called the neural tube. The superior portion of it is called the rostral portion, and the, and the lower portion is called the caudal portion. Defects of the rostral neural tube will cause malformations of the brain, and defects in the caudal neural tube will cause problems of the spinal cord. Once we understand that, we can then move on to the congenital anomalies of the spinal cord. We are going to divide the congenital anomalies of the spinal cord into two parts, spina bifida and diastematomyelia. So let's start our discussion by talking about spina bifida. Spina bifida is further divided into spina bifida occulta, meningocele, myelomeningocele. So let's start by talking about the first disorder, myelomeningocele. The key features of myelomeningocele include, uh, first of all, spinal cord is completely exposed, as you can see over here. And this results in flaccid paralysis and loss of sensation in the legs, and it can also result in incontinence of bowel and bladder. Another certain feature that we need to understand here is that myelomeningocele is associated with Chiari 2 malformation. Chiari 2 malformation is characterized by the displacement of cerebellar tonsils and medulla through the foramen magnum. So here you can see that the cerebellar tonsils and brainstem have displaced downwards. And this downward displacement can result in hydrocephalus by compressing on the outflow of CSF. The findings that you're going to see in uh, the serum of the mother is increased serum alpha fetoprotein and if you check the amniotic fluid you will find out that alpha fetoprotein and acetylcholinesterase is also increased. The treatment of myelomeningocele involves treating the specific defects that are found in the disorder. First, to treat the spinal defect we have to refer to operative closure. For hydrocephalus treatment, we have to perform a VP shunt. Remember that hydrocephalus is something which can be caused by Chiari 2 malformation. And as for the low cord dysfunction, we use physical therapy, braces, and even intermittent bladder catheterization to help the patient. And in most cases, if folate is supplemented to the mother, uh, we are able to prevent the occurrence of uh, neural tube defects like myelomeningocele. So next, we'll move on to meningocele. Uh, meningocele is characterized by the exposure of the cystic meninges, but it is important to note that the spinal cord itself is intact, unlike myelomeningocele where spinal cord was also exposed. It is also associated with lipoma and a dermoid cyst. Dermoid cyst is essentially a tract extending from the skin to the meninges, and when infected, it can cause meningitis. There is also weakness and numbness of the feet, and we can also have incontinence. The next disorder we're going to discuss is called spina bifida occulta. In spina bifida occulta, the skin is intact as you can see here, but under the skin, the spinal cord or the underlying bone is defective. As you can see in this case, there is an absence of any bony prominences in this region, which can indicate that there is an underlying defect. It can also be associated with a tuft of hair above the site of defect. So you, can, you might see a tuft of hair on the skin just outside the defect. This disease is also associated with lipoma and dermoid cysts. We can also have weakness and numbness of feet as well as incontinence. So now that we're done with spina bifida, we can then move on to the other disorder, which is called diastematomyelia. So the characteristic feature of diastematomyelia is a bony or fibrous band that divides the spine into two longitudinal sections. So here you can see a normal cross-sectional image of the spinal cord, but in the case of diastematomyelia, there would be a fibrous band extending in between the spinal cord, which will cut it into two pieces of two longitudinal pieces of the spinal cord. This illness is also associated with lipomas, and there is weakness and numbness of the feet and incontinence. So now we'll move on to the congenital anomalies of the brain. First of all, anencephaly. As you can see from the image, there is no cortex or cranium present, but there is a rudimentary brainstem present inside. The next disorder is called encephalocele. In encephalocele, what we can see is a sac-like protrusion of the meninges with or without brain. 
that means that you could either have meninges alone or you could have meninges with brain content inside the sac-like protrusion. Next is agenesis of corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is a band of white matter uh, present in our brain which connects the two hemispheres together. But if it's absent, it can result in neurological problems. You can see the corpus callosum mentioned right here. The next disorder in our list is called dandy walker malformation. The dandy walker malformation is characterized by a triad of findings. Firstly, the absence of cerebellar vermis. You can see it right here. The second thing we can see is cystic fourth ventricle dilation, which we can see in this diagram here. And finally, we can also see an enlarged posterior fossa, which can be seen right here. So when we find these three together, we can classify that disorder as dandy walker malformation. Next is holoprosencephaly. Holoprosencephaly is due to the failure of the forebrain, which is also called as prosencephalon, to divide into two lobes. It is associated with trisomy 13, which is also called as Petau syndrome, and it is also associated with trisomy 18, which is also called as Edward syndrome. It is also important to know that a lobar type of holoprosencephaly has a much poorer prognosis. Here you can see the brain, and normally there is supposed to be a division right in the center, but as you can see, there is no division and the brain is just one whole unit. There is a lack of the division. Next disorder in our list is called hydronencephaly. In hydronencephaly, the brain develops normally, but then gets destroyed intrauterine, most commonly due to vascular insults. And this results in virtual absence of the cerebrum, but with an intact skull, as compared to anencephaly, where the cranium is absent as well. So here you can see that if you shine a light right through the cranium, you'll see that the light passes right through. So there is really no brain within this cranium, but the cranium itself is intact. But in anencephaly, both the cranium and brain were affected. So now we can move on to macrocephaly. Macrocephaly is characterized by the head circumference being more than the 95th percentile. There are three main causes of macrocephaly, macrocrania, which means that we have an increase in the thickness of the skull itself, and this is mostly due to diseases of the bone metabolism or hypertrophy. For example, achondroplasia, fragile X syndrome, or osteopetrosis are all causes of macrocrania, which further leads to macrocephaly. Another cause of macrocephaly is hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is due to or is basically characterized by enlargement of the ventricles and this in turn leads to macrocephaly and lastly the third cause of macrocephaly is something called megalencephaly megalencephaly refers to the brain enlargement due to abnormal metabolic substance accumulation for example in the neurocutaneous disorders like neurofibromatosis or neurodegenerative disorders like sphingolipidosis we can have abnormal accumulation and we can then have increased brain size. To make sure the macrocephaly is not physiologic, it's always good to plot the head circumference on a growth chart. Next we're going to discuss is microcephaly. Microcephaly refers to head circumference less than the third percentile. And the most common cause of this is usually the small brain size itself. During the prenatal period, brain growth is very sensitive to any insult. So if there is an infection, if there, any, if there is any metabolic disorder, or if there is an exposure to any toxins, all of these can result in impaired brain growth, which can then lead to microcephaly. The causes are divided into primary and secondary causes. Primary causes refer to the causes which are directly related to the brain. Uh, for example, chromosomal disorders like trisomies or CNS uh, malformations or even CNS migrational disorders. And secondary causes refer to the causes which are mostly external factors like infections, toxin exposures, hypoxia systemic diseases, and a certain type of a disorder which is called craniosynostosis. Craniosynostosis refers to premature skull suture closures. So this can result in a malformed uh, cranium. So the last set of disorders we're going to discuss now are called the disorders of neuron migration. In these set of disorders, there is disruption of neuronal migration from the periventricular germinal matrix to the cortical surface. The first disorder in this set of disorders is called schizencephaly. In schizencephaly, we have CSF filled clefts within the cerebral hemispheres. You can see these here. 
If it's just unilateral, we can have congenital hemiparesis. If it's bilateral, we can have spastic quadrupedesis. And another fact is that there is also an increased risk of epilepsy associated with this disorder. Next is something called lysencephaly. What we see is smooth brain with no sulcations. So normally where there are supposed to be sulcations in the brain, we have just a smooth surface. This can result in seizures and it can even progress to developmental retardation. Next disorder in our list is called pachygyria. What we mean by that is the gyri of the brain are broad and are very few. So this is a gyrus, this is a gyrus. As you can see, it's quite broad and there are quite few. The next disorder is called polymicrogyria. In polymicrogyria, as the, as the name itself suggests, there are many small gyri. And here you can see that we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 gyri at the same time on one part of the brain. So lastly, we have gray matter heterotopias, which are characterized by abnormal islands of gray matter within central white matter, where they're not supposed to be. So here you can see the white matter and the gray matter, and within the white matter itself, you are able to see pieces of gray matter. So that's all for the discussion. If you found it useful, go ahead and leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share it with anyone you think will find this useful. Till next time.